Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we are going to talk today about, what are we going to talk about today? Concentration. <laughs> As you can see, my concentration is excellent. Um, so uh, before we start, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I uh, had to restart my computer, so I missed some of my um, things that I need here. Anyway, while I'm looking for the things that I need, uh, I want to tell you that my name is Ani Pomo Ribiki. I have been a Buddhist nun for 26 years, and I am the resident teacher and director of Song Sen Gampo uh, Buddhist Center of Cleveland. Uh, we have a center in Lakewood, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland, and um, normally we would be there, but because of the uh, pandemic, we are not there until things get safe. I don't know if um, everybody knows this, but Ohio has just become one of the worst uh, for um, COVID cases. So um, yeah, so that's why every Sunday, except the last Sunday of the month, I'm here giving a little Dharma talk and, um, some guided meditation, and the rest of our classes, retreats, seminars, movie nights, um, and and uh, re yeah, I think that's everything, are on um, Zoom. So if you want, good morning, Kathleen, Sylvie, hi, um, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, so below you will find the, um, how you can sign up for the newsletter, which is the best thing because that's everything up to date completely, okay? And also you will find a link for the closing prayers that we're gonna do at the end here. If um, that is your jam, then load them down, uh, download them. If not, no problem. There's no, um, of course, no, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Um, okay, so as I said, today's topic is, um, concentration, which is the fifth of the six paramitas. Um, and we will talk about that as soon as we establish our bodhicitta motivation. So um, please just settle in, get your mind and body sort of together and calm and maybe take a deep breath. <sighs> so... <clears throat> So bodhicitta is the wish to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. It is the entire goal of this path. So though we are working on ourselves here, it's not about navel gazing or um, some kind of self-indulgence. It's really about uh, gaining the qualities or let's say better, better terminology is uncovering the qualities of our Buddha nature that will allow us to benefit others in the maximum uh, way possible, okay? So bodhicitta is not synonymous with compassion, but it uh, grows out of compassion. So when we think about all the suffering in this world, um, human suffering, animal suffering, and the suffering in other realms as well, um, you know, it's really heartbreaking. And that tender heart that arises when we think of the suffering of others is compassion. So when we feel compassion, we have a strong desire to remove the suffering of others. We want them to be happy and to be, you know, free of this suffering, excuse me. So what makes bodhicitta different from ordinary compassion is that it contains this aspect of wisdom, which understands the um, cause of suffering, which is fundamental ignorance, okay? And that fundamental ignorance is what causes us to um, create negative karma, which then comes back to us as suffering. So please, in whatever way makes sense to you, at least make the wish that the time we spend together this morning is beneficial, not only for you, but for all beings. And then um, I'd like to take just a second to um, 
consider our um, precious teachers, um, Jigme Kinsu Rinpoche, Chukupema Wangil Rinpoche, and Taku Mata Rinpoche. Um, they are so, so precious uh, and, you know, extraordinary. And uh, without them, I'm starting to cry, sorry. Uh, without them, I wouldn't know anything. I wouldn't be able to practice. Um, and I'm sure it's the same for all of us. Um, even the texts that we read are because of them. So we just think of them with gratitude and with respect. And if we're so inclined, um, we also ask for their blessings, which are so important, so we can understand the teachings and put them into practice. Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting verklempt. Okay. I love them so much. All right. So as I said, we're going to be talking about concentration today. So I am using um, as a, a resource for this, um, this text. It's called Words of My Perfect Teacher. There's a link below if you if you um, want to buy it. It should be in the library too um, if, you, if you don't want to buy it. Anyway, it's a wonderful um, traditional text, and um, that's what we are using today. So in this text, it's that for concentration, two things are needed. To renounce excitement and distracting preoccupation, and to stay in a solitary place. So to stay in a solitary place, you know, for the vast majority of us is not possible, right? It's really not possible. We can't just walk out the door, to, you know, abandon our family and our job and just say, I'm gonna go to live in a solitary place, guys, all right? However, it does emphasize a couple of things. One, and this is from the teachings in general, not from this text. One is that, um, the importance of retreat, doing retreat for however long, okay? We really um, should try to do a proper retreat um, once in a while, not just once in our life, but, you know, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year, something like that. Because when you're in retreat, it is like being in, 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 in a solitary place. Um, we can really concentrate. Um, we can get much deeper in our practice than we would um, just practicing on our own at home in the midst of our regular life and all the distractions therein. So please, if you have the opportunity, please do that. And now it's quite difficult, of course, because of COVID. But once this thing is over, then um, do make an effort. And you can do your own retreat at home, you know, if possible. You know, you could take the weekend, for example, excuse me, and tell your friend, your family, um, look, I just don't want to be disturbed this weekend. You know, I'm going to be doing my practice as much as possible. And then don't speak during that time and really try to keep, you know, your environment as quiet and distraction free as possible. So turn off your phone, put your computer somewhere else and just do your practice. So that's one possibility. Um, the other thing about solitary place, I believe it was uh, Zonsar Kensir Rinpoche who said that, you know, what that means really is leaving our projections and our conflicting emotions behind. So that's something we can work with. That's something we can do, even if we can't go live in a solitary place. Okay, so let's go over these things one by one. So giving up distractions. So the main point here is that uh, whatever is brought together will fall apart. That's just the truth of impermanence. And if you don't believe that, that's fine. Look for yourself and try to find something that has come together that doesn't fall apart. And here, very interestingly, uh, they talk about relationships and uh, that we have to, it says here, we have to understand the futility of becoming attached to ephemeral loved ones and friends. So, wow, like that sounds really bizarre, right? Sounds so like cold and strange. 
So, but what it really means is like not letting our relationships keep us from practicing, okay? It doesn't mean don't have loved ones, don't have relationships, okay? We have to understand two things according to the teachings. One is that our relationships are impermanent, right? They last for this life and they don't come with us into the next life. We die alone. And the only thing that comes with us into the next life is our karma. So if we're creating a lot of negative karma, that's the other point. The, our relationships can keep us from practicing because we feel strange or they don't want us to take the time or like they're asking us to go out with them when we, sh you know, when we need the time to practice, stuff like that. Okay. The other is the negative karma that we can create because of our relationships. All right. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but just to mention a few like fighting, okay. Like stealing, uh, lying and so forth, gossiping. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. So the next thing they talk about in this um, little section is uh, that we're never satisfied. So the quote here is, wanting things is what causes all of our troubles. <laughs> and we're never satisfied with what we have, okay? And again, always, always in the Buddhist teachings, um, we are really encouraged to not believe them. Isn't that strange? Not believe them. Don't believe them. But look for yourself. Approach the teachings and approach the practice like a scientist, like a good scientist, right? So a good scientist hears a theory or develops a theory and then in a way tries to disprove it. Or at least if they're trying to prove it, they're very open to what might arise that could be a surprise for them. In fact, that's how a lot of things are discovered, right? And invented because someone was trying for something else and along the way, they found, you know, if you put these two things together, an amazing thing happens, right? So, hi, Angelina. So, um, I, uh, da, da, da. All right. So, this particular point, um, you hear the Dalai Lama saying this kind of thing quite a lot in his teachings. It says, even if one person were to own all the wealth, wealth and possessions in the whole world, it would not change the fact that he should still only need enough food and clothing for one person, right? So you can be Imelda Marcos. Maybe that's too old of a reference for some of you. But anyway, um, she apparently had like thousands of shoes, pairs of shoes. She still only has two feet, you know. So how many shoes do you really need? So, um, so this is talking about trying to get material gain, right? So um, it says here too, they waste their whole lives. So people who, who really spend a lot of time and effort just trying to get, 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 right? They waste their whole lives without ever experiencing even a single day of freedom, well-being, or happiness. Because they're so like, they're, they're like imprisoned by their greed or their um, this constant sense of, of wanting, right? Um, and uh, from, to get material things, people do a lot of negative acts. I mean, we see that all the time, right? Um, they lie, they cheat, you know, any, almost any business, you know, they present product in, in a really deceiving way. You know, an interesting thing to look at if you haven't seen it already. I don't know what you would Google to, to find it, but um, it's people who ordered things off of eBay uh, that turned out to be completely different because the description of the, of the object was totally deceptive. So like they want to buy a dress, for example, and it looks like a really nice dress. And when it arrives, the dress is like this big. It's like for a doll. But they put the seller put like for a doll, like in really small print somewhere or something like that. Or one time somebody got ordered a camera and got a picture of a camera. <laughs> so that's really right. That's a good example of like totally lying. Uh, 
And um, it says here, uh, for material things, people do a lot of negative acts, only to lose it all before they die or at death, right? So that's one of the problems, actually, of having a lot of things, of having a lot of wealth. People are always trying to find a way to get it out of you, right? They might rob you. They might attack you. They might even kill you for it, right? You see these stories, a lot of stories about um, spouses killing each other for the insurance money, for the life insurance money. I mean, good Lord. Okay. And as I said before, their, their karma is the only thing that comes with them. So you spend your whole life amassing wealth. And at the end, you can't do anything with it, right? Like, I love this saying, you know, you never see a hearse hauling a U-Haul, right? Never see a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. We can't take anything with us when we die, except for our karma. So really, our acts of body, speech, and mind are so much more important than wealth, okay? Um, as far as, like, not being able to use it, I often think of somebody, I always think, actually, of Jeff Bezos, who is the head of Amazon, if you don't know. And um, this guy has, like, more money than God, okay? Like, more money than he could spend in his whole life. And he won't spend it on his workers, you know, to make things better for them. And they're working for Amazon is really... Um, Abusive, actually, really, really difficult. Uh, so he could spend enough money to like make every Amazon worker across the world like upper middle class, not even rich, just upper middle class, and not even miss it. They like drop in a bucket for him, but he's grasping, grasping. He needs more, he needs more, more, more. Okay, we don't want to be like that. So the teachings say, be content with what you have, all right? Otherwise, your search for more will only waste your time and heap up negative acts. So be content with what you have doesn't mean if you're living on the street and begging, you should just be happy with that. If you think about um, Maslow's theory of self-actualization, I think it's called. Anyway, that pyramid, you know, we do need to have our basic needs met. We need food, we need clothing, we need shelter, you know, we need work um, to, you know, pay for those things. Um, but beyond having like what we need, we don't need more than that. And we should just be happy with that, you know? I have a house, I have clothes, I'm healthy, I have enough food, you know, this kind of thing. Okay. And there was also a study that showed like when, what kind of income people needed to feel like safe and I don't know, satisfied, but relatively happy, maybe relatively content was not that much money. And everything above that, I can't remember what the, what the number was, but, um, and everything above that, it didn't make any difference at all to the person's happiness. All right. So then um, another point under, so we're still under giving up distractions, okay? So now they talk about renounce childish friends, quote unquote, childish friends. So these are the people in our life who like, they're ungrateful for our help. They says here, return your help with harm. They're hard to please. They're jealous. They, they see you with contempt. And it says, the more time you spend with them, the more your negative acts increase. So just let them go, you know. Um, doesn't mean you have to be mean to them, but we do need to be careful who we spend time with because our friends, um, they do influence us, right? They influence the way they we think. They influence the things we do. So we should be, you know, careful about who we hang out with. And um, if we find that our friends are leading us in the wrong direction, then, you know, slowly let them go, spend less time with them, and find friends who encourage us to um, act positively. All right, so the third thing they mention here under distractions is our careers, which I find also really interesting. Um, so it says, uh, those are work, also offers us a host of distractions, an opportunity for increasing our negative karma. 
and the goals uh, uh, involved with the career are inconsequential and without real meaning. Wow. So of course we have to work. Most of us have to work, right? But if we think about like the break room or the the lunch, you know, cafeteria, whatever, and the gossip that goes on there, you know, so much negativity there, so much negative karma of speech is is uh, created like that. Then the stealing involved in that, taking what is not given, even office supplies, like companies lose a tremendous amount of money just with their workers taking home pens and paper and staplers and crap like that. And then like tax evasion, even if we're not the one, okay, so um, most of us are not CEOs, but you know, tax evasion of the company, lies that come with buying and selling and so forth, okay, like I talked about earlier with business. So, you know, while we work, we need to be very mindful. Not that we need to quit our job, but unless we're doing something that is of what's called wrong livelihood, which is things like, you know, making bombs or weapons or actually um, making or serving alcohol, um, same thing for like cigarettes, um, killing animals in any form, all this kind of stuff is considered wrong livelihood. In that case, we should definitely find another job if possible. You know, again, um, it's very easy to say, hey, find another job. But especially in this economy, you know, that can be impossible. So um, maybe, you know, at least aspire to find another job. Okay, so we need to be very mindful when we're at work. We need to be really mindful of our body, speech, and mind. What we think, what we say, and what we do so that we don't create negative karma, okay? And also, we shouldn't think that work or career or money is the most important thing in our life, all right? Which people do do. And it's by thinking that we don't practice. Actually, the teachings say that, you know, practice is the most important thing. So if we're not practicing because of our career or because of our family or because of our friends, we should rethink it, okay? So last point here is abandon all these endless activities and distractions like so much spit in the dust. Leave your homeland behind and head for unknown lands and practice. Well, we already talked about that. Not so easy, right? So... <clears throat> And later it says, avoid falling, but, okay, avoid falling into an extreme, which will bring about excessive fatigue or practicing an exaggerated asceticism, which will put an end to your life. So even if we're like really gung-ho and we're like really devoted to practicing, even then we should be balanced and reasonable, all right? Understand what our limitations are, um, don't push so hard that we break, okay? That's the point. Something that is not listed in this text just because of the time. Sorry, I need some water, excuse me. Is um, all our electronic devices. <clears throat> so um, we're very familiar with that, I'm sure. You know, our phones, the computer, the streaming TV, you know, all this stuff is constant, constant, constant distraction. And we even distract ourselves from the distraction. We're looking at our phone while we're watching TV. Okay. I Guilty. Okay. So be aware of that. Um, we can get hypnotized by social media, um, you know, games on our phone or on the computer, um, you know, TV, okay? And, and I mean hypnotized when I say that because we, like, we lose track of time, okay? We lose awareness of, like, what we need to do, okay? Um, and we don't practice, you know? I, <laughs> people say like, I don't have time to practice. Like I, I'm asking two of the groups in our Sangha to practice two hours a day. And people, when they hear that are kind of like, oh, 
two hours a day. Oh my God, that's so much time. I can't do that. But then we watch Netflix or whatever for four hours. So yeah, we have time. Of course, there are days or there are situations where we really don't have time, right? But most of us have more time than we think, okay? And if we look at our day and kind of what we are actually doing with our time, um, we might be surprised by how much time we actually have. And again, I'm not saying, oh, don't watch TV ever, or throw away your phone and the computer. It doesn't mean that. It just means, again, like, be honest, you know. We should be honest about what time we actually have to practice. And we need to make the practice our top priority, which is kind of hard to do, actually. But we should really at least try to make our practice the top priority. I still remember, and I think this was back in 1990 or something, um, Sonsar Kenser and Bichet asked this huge group of people, I think it was, anyway, it doesn't matter what it was. Anyway, he asked us, um, if you had, if you have scheduled your practice from, let's say, 9 to 10 in the morning, and you look at your calendar, and you see that you have a dentist appointment at 9, what do you do? So think about that while I cough, excuse me. <coughs> okay, so people said, well, I would go to the dentist appointment, right? And he's like, isn't that crazy? We don't even like going to the dentist. We should reschedule that appointment because it falls in our practice time. We should not even have set an appointment that falls in our practice time because practice is the most important, all right? Okay, so um, the next um, point is like solitary being in, in living in solitude, okay? It says here, um, which is again, really interesting, in places where you feel lonely, concentration arises. Now, that sounds again like, what? what the hell are you talking about? But if you think, sorry for swearing, if you think about what we said earlier, the distractions that, you know, family and job and all of that, friends and all that provide, it's hard to concentrate, okay? It's very hard to concentrate also. Um, it doesn't say here, but in other texts it says, like, if we don't live a moral life, it's really hard to concentrate, which is another thing that's, like, doesn't seem obvious just by saying that, but if we think about it a little bit, it really does make sense. You know, if you think about, I don't know if you're like this, but I'm like this. If I'm in conflict with someone, oh, I just get obsessed with it, you know? And when I try to sit, that's all that arises. Oh, they said this, it was so painful, and what should I do? And I said that, and I shouldn't have said that, and what will I say next time, and why is this person, blah, 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 blah. It's very hard, right? And um, I did a, a one-year retreat in solitude one time, and I really worried, actually, about being lonely in that retreat. I was not lonely as far as feeling like depressed and I had no friends, but I was alone. And I can tell you that it is so much easier to practice in that way. Uh, you can see much more clearly, like, what is real, what is not real, what is important, what is not important, what is our, our you know, projection, and what is reality. It's, and then, of course, to meditate, that just isn't the going on in our mind as much. It's not like it doesn't happen, but it's not as fierce, and it's fierce. It's not as strong, and it's not as um, constant, you know. Okay, again, doesn't mean we can't have friends, doesn't mean we have to walk out on our family. It's just to realize and to kind of think about the bigger picture, right? The bigger picture is they're gonna die, I'm gonna die. You know, I'm, I, the only thing that comes with me in my next life is the karma, is karma. I really wanna attain enlightenment 
for myself and for others. So I can't do that if I'm just wasting time gossiping and clubbing and I don't know what, you know, okay. Um, there was this, I think it was Milarepa who's talking to, um, yes, I think it's in the 100,000 songs of Milarepa and he's talking to the people of this village called Tingri. And um, he says, you know, uh, friends and loved ones are like people passing in the marketplace. You know, I don't know what the next part is, something like be kind or something like that. So we get very involved in our um, relationships, you know, and we take them so seriously. And um, if we have this view, like I'm impermanent, they're impermanent, I'm going to die, they're going to die. It's so much easier to not get involved in petty arguments you know, especially with people that you love, right? So, you know, like when somebody gets a diagnosis of terminal cancer or something, sometimes you see people say, oh, it was a gift. And initially that can sound really bizarre, but when you, you talk, you know, when they talk more, they're like, I realized then what was important and what was not important. I realized then that I could let all these petty things go with my loved ones, you know? And something like that I, I express sometimes in this regard is like, you know, if you've been with a partner, for example, for a long time, you can wake up next to them and just kind of be like, oh, you again, you know? And feel that sort of, let's look at this person. But you love them, right? So instead of waking up, if you think about impermanence and that one day this person might not be next to you, then when you, wake up, you can look at them and say, oh, you again, like, isn't that nice? Like we're still together for this day, you know? Okay, so uh, there are good qualities that arise when we um, live in solitude, either, um, you know, what do I want to say, literally, or um, in, in our mind in a sense of like, leaving behind these lesser interests and things like that. And one of them is disenchantment with samsara. So samsara, if you don't know, is cyclic existence. This round of birth and death and birth and death and birth and death that we've all been on since beginningless time, okay? So we are actually um, in love with samsara, okay? People say like, even, you know, when you study for a long time and like we learn about all the suffering of samsara and all of that, there's still something in us that's like, it's delicious, <laughs> right? Because we don't understand the nature of it, right? And we continuing, we continuously like search for ultimate happiness and we're looking in the wrong place, okay? We're looking for ultimate happiness in impermanent things, like material things like we talked about, like relationships and all of that. The only way that we are going to attain lasting happiness is to work with the mind and the heart inside, all right? That's what's going to bring us lasting happiness, not trying to constantly manipulate the outer world, all right? So when we spend time in retreat, let's say, or when we practice a lot, we, we start to see cyclic existence in a more realistic way. And then we, we get tired of it, you know? Um, we get tired of it when we see what it is. When we don't look closely, we still have this illusion that we can get lasting happiness out of samsara, which just isn't true, okay? Um, yeah. What else I want to say? Oh, yeah. And then when we see that, we become disenchanted. We, we fall out of love. Really, it's really much, very much like that, right? Having a love, you know, being in love. <gasps> I love this person. They're the best. I'm so in love, right? And then we see who they really are. They're lying. They're cheating. They don't have the same goals, all of that. And we become disenchanted with them. And we want to leave them, okay? So when we become 
fall out of love with samsara, we then the determination to free ourselves from it really grows, okay? But we have to see what it is in order for that to happen. We can't force ourselves to have disenchantment with, to, to yes, to be disenchanted with samsara and want to leave it. If, if we still think samsara can work, all right, that eventually we'll get all our ducks together and then I'll be happy, which you, you might say all the time, I know I still say it, okay, and think this way sometimes and then I have to like snap out of it and remind myself, right? If we still think that way, then it's hard to let go, right? But if we see it for what it is, it's easy to let go. You see what I mean? So my favorite example of that, and I don't know if, I don't know where it came from, but anyway, let's say that you love marshmallows, all right? And there's something kind of mushy in your hand and you think it's marshmallows. And you're just like, mm, marshmallows. Later, I'm going to build a fire. I'm going to roast these marshmallows. It's going to be awesome. All right. And somebody tells you, hey, what you have in your hand, you have to get rid of it. You have to let that go. And you're like, no, not my beautiful marshmallows. And then they say, why don't you actually look at what's in your hand? Just have a look. And you look down at your hand and you see that it's full of dog shit. All right. Then nobody has to force you and you don't have to force yourself to let that go. You just go, ah, and you fling it away and you wash your hands. You know, that's samsara. If we don't look at it, we have this fantasy that is sweet and delicious and pleasant. But when we look at it, we see that it is just suffering. Then we want to get free. Okay naturally want to get free. We don't have to struggle. We don't have to force ourselves and nobody can force us even if they want to, okay? So um, the Buddha said that just having the intention to do retreat and taking even seven steps in that direction is worth more than making offerings to all the Buddhas, all right? And that is because it is that which is gonna help us so much to attain our goal of enlightenment. All right, then um, they talk about actual concentration, which kind of comes at the end. So um, it says here, whenever you practice concentration, it's important to take the seven point posture of Virochana. So you hear that a lot. So I'm just gonna read to you what that is. Page 432, okay. Seven point posture of Virochana is um, ma, ma, ma. legs crossed in the Vajra posture. If you can, most of us cannot. So the Vajra posture is when your um, legs are like your feet are on top of your thighs like that. Half Vajra is when one leg is. Um, my Vajra posture is in a chair because I can't sit on the floor anymore. Um, okay. Uh, nah, 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 nah. Back straight. That's actually the most important thing. Hands in the gesture of meditation. So gesture of meditation is, is actually like this. But you can be with your palms on top of each other like this. Or you can just put your hands, um, you know, palms down on your thigh or your knees, however long your arms are. All right. Uh, da, 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 eyes gazing along the nose. So not cross-eyed. All right, but just um, if you look straight ahead and then you just lower your eyes about halfway, um, that's ideal with the eyes open, okay? Chin slightly tucked in, so that's like this. Because what that does is it straightens the back of the neck. So you want like as much of the spine straight as possible. So, you know, your back can be straight, but you can be like this or you can be like this, okay? So you don't want that. A lot of people tend to do this sort of, slouch and put their chin up. So just make sure your chin is tucked in a little bit. Da -na -na. Shoulders well apart like a vulture's wings. So, you know, what I do for that, and normally I don't talk about that when I um, explain the posture, and I should. Um, so you don't want your shoulders like this, in other words, okay? You just want them which is sort of naturally gonna happen anyway when you straighten your back. So what I find really helps with that is just roll your shoulders back, 
you can do it once or you can do it a few times like that. And it naturally sort of opens up the chest, which is really good for the uh, posture. And then the final thing is the tip of the tongue touching the palate. So um, just your tongue on the roof of your mouth, which again is probably gonna happen anyway. Um, so that's the seven point posture. So um, then there's a little verse there that says, when the back is straight, the channels are straight. When the channels are straight, the energies are straight. When the energies are straight, the mind is straight. All right. So um, in the text, it says, um, keeping the back straight allows the subtle energy. So in Tibetan, it's called lung. It's roughly equivalent to the um, Chinese um, notion of qi, okay? Uh, so it allows the subtle energy to flow freely in the subtle channels called sa in Tibetan. So we have an, what's called a subtle body, um, and it's the system through which our, our mind, our consciousness um, travels through the body. So um, you probably are all familiar with chakras. Okay, so it's that system. Chakras in various places, and then central channel and two side channels and you know there's 72,000 channels according to the teachings and lots of different chakras but there's sort of five three or five main ones okay so there's it says uh there's an intimate relationship between this subtle physical system and the movements of the mind it is said that the mind rides on this energy like a rider on a horse okay then it says, don't lie down or lean against anything, but sit straight, upright, your mind free, and rest in equanimity in a state where there's no grasping to any, anything. That is the essence of transcendent concentration. All right. So as far as not lying down, um, the thing with that is that if we lie down, it's just very practical. We're much more likely to fall asleep. Same thing with our eyes closed, OK? At best, you know, we probably fall into a state of half sleep that sometimes people mistake for uh, concentrated meditation. But if you have a really bad back problem or other health problem, just go ahead and lay down if that's what you need to do. Not if you just feel like meditating lying down, because just you can if you want, but it's just not going to help you that much. All right. Myself, I have a very bad back right now. Hopefully, at some point, my karma for that will exhaust, be exhausted. Um, but, uh, and so sometimes I cannot sit. I can't sit on the floor anymore because of my knees, because I'm getting old. And I can't even sit in a chair like this uh, for very long. So what I do, and I don't like to meditate laying down because I do get very, very sleepy. So I just have like a lounge chair, like one of those folding up ones for outside, it's called a zero gravity chair, which I love. And um, I meditate in that. So I'm kind of half sitting, half laying down. And um, it's very comfortable. And I can do my whole practice like that. Okay. Uh, dee -dee -dee. Okay. So something I have not mentioned this whole time is that um, what makes these five paramitas or these five aspects uh, that we've been talking about today and the last four videos, um, transcendent or what makes them a paramita is the um, combination of these things with wisdom, all right? Meaning like the view of emptiness. That's what makes them a perfection. Otherwise, they're just ordinary, you know, generosity, patience, diligence, etc. All right. And the next video will be about wisdom and kind of the combination. So when we talk about wisdom next week, it's really going to be more uh, summation of the previous five things combined with wisdom and how to um, how we might practice that. All right. OK, so let's sit, man. OK, so, you know, the posture now because I just talked about it. Oh, I forgot to bring out the gong. Hang on one second. If you have any questions, ask. Put it in the um, put it in the chat, and then either I'll answer it now or after the meditation. So, in case you don't know, there is always time for question and answer after meditation. So, if you have a question, think of it because I, I don't wait long for that. All right.
so that's it. So you know the posture, okay? And all we're gonna do is pay attention to the sensation of the breath coming in and out of the nose, all right? That's our focus of concentration. Let's say awareness, because the word concentration makes us tense up, all right? So just gentle, spacious awareness. In the mind, we're just letting the thoughts come and go. So a thought will arise, dwell, and disappear, be replaced by another one that arises, dwells, and disappears, and on and on. And we just don't get involved in those thoughts, okay? Don't run after them, all right? Just let them be clouds moving through the sky. Keep your awareness constantly with the flow of the breath, all right? Um, when you get distracted, I say when, not if, because most of us at some point do get distracted. Don't make a big deal of it. Don't judge yourself. Just bring the mind back to the breath. Okay? All right. There's a question. Quick question. How do you fight against getting sleepy while you meditate? Oh, that's a good question. So don't close your eyes. That's one thing. But if you are still, like, getting really sleepy, um, there's a few skillful means that the teachings talk about. One is to look up for, you don't do this the whole time, but until you wake up, right? Look up or look into a light that isn't going to harm your eyes or look, you know, if it's daylight and you're near a window, just look at the sky, you know, and that will kind of wake you up. Um, another thing you can do is to really correct your posture. Oftentimes we don't notice and like while we're sitting, we just sort of start to slump over and then we can't breathe as well and that will uh, make us sleepy. Also between those three mudras or hand postures that I mentioned earlier, um, this one is gonna help you more if you are feeling tired because it's a more sort of structured um, and maybe the way the energy moves, moves through, I don't know, but you know, sit up straight, put your hands in that posture, okay? Look up, look around, kind of just get your eyes, you know, working. Um, if you're wearing a sweater or something like that, or it's it may take it off, make your body cooler. If you can open a window or turn down the heat, um, this kind of thing. If the room is dark, put on more lights. If um, you can, if you're in a situation where you can do this, another thing the teachings say is you can sort of bounce up and down in your seat like that. I have a chair that sort of goes with my palms, so it's a little hard, but let me try, try to keep the chair. So, um, and then you go, ha, 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 like that. That'll wake you up. But that'll wake up everybody else in the house too. So be careful, be wise about when you do that, all right? Then there's, um, so we're, we're not going to have that much time to meditate, but I think it's okay. So then we're going to, um, the other thing that can happen. So one, one side of the imbalance can be being really sleepy and dull. Then we do those things that I just mentioned. The other side of the imbalance can be um, being really hyper. Sometimes they call it over-concentrated, but I, I think hyper is um, easier for us to understand. So we're really hyper. Mind is racing. We feel <laughs> like that, you know, sort of nervous and all that. So if that's what's happening when we're meditating, then we just do the opposite of those things. Close your eyes for a little bit but not to the point where you fall asleep, make the room darker, make the body warmer, okay? And take, um, yeah, take this posture, your hands down. It's more open, it's more kind of relaxed, all right? And you just close your eyes, make the room darker, warmer, okay? Until you feel calm, then take the regular meditation posture again, okay? Thanks for asking that question. All right, so I'm gonna start the um, meditation by ringing this beautiful singing bowl that I call a gong, and I'm gonna end like that. Uh, we're gonna go just a few minutes over because I'd like to have a little more time for meditation. So I hope that's okay. If you need to leave exactly at 1130, please, you can do that. All right, we're gonna go until like 1135, okay? All right, so let's begin.
bring your mind back to the breath. Your body should be as relaxed as possible while maintaining the posture. And your mind should be as relaxed as possible while maintaining gentle awareness of the breath. You're not trying to stop the thoughts. Just let them come and go without getting involved. And rest the mind on the breath like a butterfly on a swaying flower. Gentle touch, but con constant. Now, if you like, you can begin to count the breaths, counting either every in-breath or every out-breath to a total of 10 complete breaths. This is a skill for me. It's for helping us to realize more quickly if we've gotten distracted because we'll lose count. If you get distracted and you don't get to 10, doesn't matter. As soon as you realize that, bring the mind back. Start again at 1. If you get to 10, again, don't get distracted by that. Don't make a big deal. Just come back, start again at 1. If you go beyond 10, another form of distraction. Just come back to 1, okay? So please begin that now if you want to.
Okay. So now we are going to do the closing prayers. If you want to join in, the link for them is below. Starting with the long life prayers. Long life prayers we do just in Tibetan. Um, and the... Okay, well, I'll tell you when we get there. All right, so let's start there. Kanri wawe kowe shinkam su pendan de wa manu juene chen re si wan ten zeng yam so yi sha pe kya kya pa chu ten kya shi om swasti chik me rab cham se yu chen la ki ken se du ka nun se nu dan chok so su mi shi to che ta ten chin Tendra men petri ne ta shi shu. Om swasti tse la kyam sa chin la chin ju ne. Nun se tak se kyu chu pe ma wang. Sang su na dre kyo po cha cha ne. La chen ten de shi ten ta ke shu. Nama kum kam sambo su wa dep shu tu ku tse ring wa su wa dep Tri ne ta shing ge pa su wa dep Nama dan dre wa me pa ching gi du So on the next page, the first one we do in English and Tibetan. The next three we just do in Tibetan and then we say the hundred syllable mantra. By this merit, may all attain omniscience, may defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of cyclic existence, may I free all beings. So nam di tam che sik pa ni chong ne ne pe dra nam tam che shin ke ga na chi ba long tru pa yi si pe so le dro wa dro wa sho. May Bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. Ever absorbed in the display of divine forms and primordial awareness, appearance, sound, and perception in the state of divinities, mantras, and dharmakaya, may I, inseparable from the practice of the profound and secret great yoga, attain within the essence of mind the state of one taste. Om Vajra Sarpa Samaya Manupalaya Vajra Sarpa Chinopa Tishta Jito Me Bawa Suto Kayo Me Bawa Supo Kayo Me Bawa Anurato Me Bawa Sangwa Siri Me Prayat Sasawa Kama Sutsa Me Chitam Sri Yang Kuru Ha 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 Ho Bhagawan Sawadatta gata vajra ma me mun sa vajri bhava ma samaya sattva Okay, so that's it for today. If you have a question, I'll wait and um, please feel free to ask it and I will do my best to answer it. Okay, I don't see any questions. So um, before we end, I just want to remind you that we have um, Zoom practice for the, thank you, Kathleen, for the, on Buddha days, Rinpoche she asked us to do the Buddha sadhana. So that happens. Thanks, Sylvie. That happens um, at various times, it's not a regular time because the Buddha days are according to the lunar calendar. So um, if you sign up for the newsletter, we talk about that. If you look on our website, there's the dates and there will be the Zoom link. Zoom link changes every time, so make sure you check that um, each time, okay? There's also a, a list there of all the Buddha days until February. So um, I guess that's it. Sign up for the newsletter. If you can donate, I'm bringing out my begging bowl and asking you to please donate because um, even though we're not at the center anymore, we still have to pay rent, we have to pay utilities, we have to pay um, 
you know, salaries and all that kind of stuff. So um, please, if you can, any kind of donation, small or large. And if you can't, of course, we understand it's a really difficult economic time. So, um, but please try if you can, all right? And then, like I said, all links below, website, newsletter, everything. All right, so have a look. And um, I hope to see you soon. I really enjoy spending time with you this morning. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Angelina. Bye, Edward. Bye-bye.